Okay, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us, uh, everyone, on this uh, uh, webinar. Um, the, uh, the title uh, of this webinar is, and I'm putting my slides right there now, um, the five mitigation strategies that every private practice physical therapy must apply right now. Uh, these are key strategies that can help you mitigate your risk and take the fast track to recovery. So um, besides uh, uh, my business partner, uh, Dr. Isopoulos, uh, and uh, um, one quick second, uh, Christina, Bart McDonald, please contact him. He has a hard time to get in. Um, I'm telling him call Christina. Um, so besides um, um, uh, uh, Costas Rizopoulos, my business partner and myself that um, we will be making this presentation, we have with us um, many of um, uh, our um, partners in our HADS organization um, uh, Christina Panetta from Panetta Physical Therapy. Uh, we have uh, Joe and uh, soon his uh, wife next to him yeah, will be there, Angie McGilbray <laughs> from Apex Physical Therapy. Uh, and uh, uh, we are going to have uh, Bart McDonald from uh, Superior Physical Therapy. Um, and uh, uh, before I start discussing this issue, I want to thank all of you so much for your amazing participation uh, in the PT for Heroes um, grassroots initiative that all of you had made so alive. Um, what can I say? I mean, the, the stories, your stories that you are posting with videos on the ptforheroes.com site um, in both videos and, and writing your stories, uh, but also the um, tremendous uh, media um, attention that you have brought to this uh, um, grassroots effort um, via radio. Um, what can I say? I mean, look at this here. I mean, signs outside their practice with PT for Heroes. This is this is so amazing. And, and um, uh, actually, I would like to take the opportunity of having an audience here and, and ask you for a call to action. What is the next step in this effort right now? The next step is really to get endorsement from some of our professional organizations. So what you can do is this, you can go to the ptforheroes.com website, you can click under resources, and there click under association contacts. You are gonna find there the contacts of people from the American Physical Therapy Association, the Occupational Therapy Association, Speech Pathology, the AMA, the Nurses Association, and the American Academy of Emergency Medicine. So we are asking you to send emails to these people and ask them to endorse and or support the PT for Heroes um, uh, grassroots uh, effort. And uh, uh, we have also, in case you don't want to write your own letter, we are giving you a sample template, an association letter, that you can copy and paste from here um, and you can then um, uh, really uh, disseminate this to all of these uh, professional organizations. So once again, um, uh, thank you all of you for participating and I'm gonna be very fast in the presentation because the idea is for all of us to discuss um, everything that we um, um, have to discuss about the recovery phase, the path to recovery, and how we can make it as fast and as effective as possible. And the people we have with us, um, they are also heroes, like all of you. 
they have done amazing things in their practices during this um, uh, uh, pandemic uh, that they will be sharing with you so everybody can get some new ideas. But here is the concept that Costas and I want to communicate with you today. First of all, um, today's reality is actually tomorrow's hope, and I'm going to say it's even more than that. It is tomorrow's opportunity because there is something that can be done about it, and you have to do something about changing the current environment. Why? Not only because that's the right thing to do, but also because you have, if you want an obligation, an obligation um, to yourself and an obligation to your patients, to your staff, to your business. Look at this. Right now, if you do nothing, your business will shrink to some degree. I don't know if you are operating at a 30% capacity, 40% capacity, or 10% capacity, or zero capacity. Some practices are down here, are down to zero. As a matter of fact, I want to find out more about this. So please go ahead and answer this poll real quick, where I'm asking you if you are a private practice owner, if you have received uh, the payroll protection program funding, uh, and also if uh, you are operating and at what patient capacity are you operating, yeah. and also if you have received the EIDL advance funding. The EIDL advance funding is the $10,000, right, that you get as advance from the EIDL emergency loan. All right, so uh, take a moment real quick and just vote. so that we can get all the numbers we need. Okay. So, uh, and I'm gonna close this in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, good. I'm gonna close the polling right now and we'll get the results. All right, I'm gonna share it right now with all of you. So, Yes, 91% of the people who are with us, they are private practice owner. 70% um, of you have not received yet your PPP funding. And guess what? This is really very representative of small businesses. We just check with IFA, with the International Franchise Association. 79% um, or 76% of their members have not received their PPP funding. So we're right there. Um, those of you who have, uh, and uh, we have in one of our companies, we have filed PPPs for five different companies. We have funded only in one. Um, and then uh, in what patient capacity do you operate? Um, most of you here are able to operate between 20 to 40% and nobody more than 60%, okay? Uh, and some of you, 35% of the people between zero to 20%. And I'm gonna talk about that and the importance of new patients, okay, on this. And have you received your EIDL funding? 78% of you, no, and only 22% of you, yes. So uh, these are the results. This is what we've got right now. But look, if we do something about it, if we don't do actually something about it right now that we're gonna start going up to the road to recovery, that road to recovery will be very slow and we may not even reach the initial, um, the, the pre-COVID-19 status that we had in terms of our incomes. Whether your income was $100,000 a week, a month, it doesn't matter, but you may not reach that full potential Again, as a matter of fact, there is an estimation that about 17 to 20% of small businesses may never be able to recover. Just today, news from uh, uh, what company is that cost us? Neiman Marcus? Yeah. Neiman Marcus announced that they are going out of business. There is a potential word for going out of business of Macy's and uh, um, actually 
um, uh, even Virgin Atlantic might be <clears throat> going out of business unless they get some help, some funding. But look, if we do something, if we follow specific mitigation strategies right now, then yes, we're going to go down. We have been down already. But our path to recovery will be faster. And I believe that if we implement all of these, all five strategies I'm going to talk about, uh, you're going to be able in 60 to 90 days to be even above your uh, operating, uh, your previous operating basis. So what are these five strategies? What I'm gonna talk, what am I talking about? I'm gonna put a summary of those, okay? So here we go. Oh, this is one more slide before I go to that. It is our estimation that if a practice does a full implementation of telehealth, of telept and diagnostic testing right now, by the end of the year, they are going to have potentially 180% recovery. Not 80% recovery, 180% recovery. This is our projection. This is what we are aiming for in our business, for 180% recovery. All right, so these are the five uh, strategies. One, cash, liquidity. Two, expense mitigation. Three, diagnostic testing. Four, implementation of telehealth. Five, maintain the office open. Very quickly, each of them. All right, cash is king. Uh, you have applied for the PPP loan. You told us. If you haven't, you still have a chance. Go ahead and apply for your PPP loan even if you have $5 million in the bank. Most likely, if you have $5 million in the bank, you are not among the people who are attending this um, uh, uh, workshop right now. Um, if you have them in your business account, I mean. Your personal account, you might have you know, a lot more than that. But um, So you're gonna have to bring people back to work. Why? Because this is how you are gonna get your forgiveness. But here is the point. Do not pay people just a salary, just bringing them back to get a forgiveness without giving them tasks to do. If you bring people back and they are just sitting idle there while they're receiving a paycheck, that will bring the morale down of your entire organization. That would be more of a criminal exchange. It's like these people will do nothing and they'll be receiving something. So don't put your organization into that. Take advantage of this situation. And even if you don't have enough patients, put them to do tasks and activities that will increase, do, that they'll better your organization, they'll improve the management of your organization, and you prepare them for a huge marketing. Actually, uh, I had a fantastic conversation with Christina Panetta, who she will share with us some of the specific strategies she is about to implement with the staff members she's bringing back with the um, uh, uh, PPP money she uh, has received. So uh, do apply for the EIDL. Now, some people, when they look at EIDL, they are thinking that EIDL is only the $10,000. No, it's not. EIDL funding is up to $2 million at 3.75% interest rate. So this is money that potentially you can use for expansion opportunities. Okay. So, and yes, Bart, I would like you to talk to us about some ideas on how somebody could use use potentially EIDL money to expand their practice and perform even acquisitions of other practices. And definitely go to save physical therapy and use the resources you have there with all previous recordings. Okay, expense mitigation. All right, so um, right now, I hope that most of you, before at least you receive your PPP money, you have converted your staff to hourly or to part-time. It's hard for businesses uh, to keep everybody full-time without getting revenue. And I, and I know 
some of the struggles that Joe and Angie Malgivre um, uh, have had uh, because they have kept most of their staff in a full-time capacity, and that can be very challenging. So some of the other challenges you have, and we have these challenges. You have a staff member who makes, I don't know, $15 an hour because that's the minimum in New York. In some other states, they still pay people minimums $12 and $13 an hour. Meanwhile, with unemployment right now, they can make three, $4,000 a month. They can make more than what you can offer them. How do you handle this stuff? That is a very good question and a forum to discuss that. So rent negotiations can be done, but also um, call up your credit cards and ask them to decrease your interest rate. Ask them to give you zero interest rate until the end of the year. Some credit card companies will do that. And absolutely create a budget. Create a budget for the next 12 months. Okay, not just till the end of the year, for the rest 12 months. Use in the budget the money you are going to get from the PPP uh, carefully and properly expensed and forgiven, most of it, and then create a budget where you are going to show how the income as you are growing the business will be coming in and how you're going to be spending it. This is, it can be very dangerous because you're going to receive the PPP money for you to start spending now all this money, not regulating, not controlling your expenses, and you run out of money and you go out of business, okay? So let's be very careful about that. Mitigation strategy number three, implementation of diagnostic testing. And what am I talking about here? I'm talking about bringing in your organization like electromyography, nerve conduction studies, and musculoskeletal ultrasound, okay? So this will provide you four different revenue sources, four different streams of revenue. What is that? You are gonna test your own patients, okay? And by testing your own patients, you're gonna be able to build the insurance company and receive revenue directly from the insurance company. And now you are telling me, yes, but we only have 20% of our patients. Yes, we are only having 30% of our patients. Well, guess what? This 30% of your patients or 20% of your patients are candidates for diagnostic testing, which you can start implementing within 30 days from the moment you join our organization, Hands-On Diagnostics. And that can procure for you revenue that can be three, four, five, sometimes more than that times the amount that you get from a single physical therapy visit. But that's not the only thing you can do. Many of us within HADS, we have outside businesses. In other words, we go to physicians' offices and hospital and medical centers, organizations, and for a fee for service, we provide these diagnostic tests, even to our colleague, physical therapists who are not performing diagnostic testing, we make agreements and we go and we perform these diagnostic, diagnostic tests for them so that we receive a fee for providing this service. And of course, when you provide these diagnostic tests in physicians' offices and medical centers, that can become a great referral source for physical therapy for you, okay? And of course, direct access. Um, if you go right now to findbestpt.com, you're gonna see the HADS approved diagnostic centers around the country where via direct access patients come, come to our centers and they receive diagnostic testing. All right, um, and uh, okay. So here is some of the people who are here. This is how much money they made per visit without diagnostics. And this is how much they made with diagnostics and the percentage of increase. Christina, she makes 90 bucks per visit without diagnostics, but 125 with diagnostics. That's 38.8% increase. And she's bringing over in, an, in a 12 month period, 180,000. Angie and Joe, uh, they, they average 80 bucks without diagnostics and 104 with diagnostics. 
That's a 30% increase. We, they, they brought in like 130 grand. Um, BART, uh, 104 without diagnostics, 137 without, with diagnostics. That's a 31.7% increase at $360,000. And our business, one of our businesses, it's called In Motion Physical Therapy, uh, DBA, hands-on EMG testing. Um, for physical therapy, we average $85 a visit with diagnostics, 125. That's a 47% increase and $1.9 uh, million just from diagnostics. Okay, so this is, this is a story. This is what can be true for you. And you can get more information at hadsmeeting.com. All right, telept, telehealth services, very, very important. And there are three ways to implement this. This is future, guys. Tele-PT can be done just from your own staff. You can outsource it, or you can use a blended model where some patients you keep them in-house, some patients you outsource. There are companies that outsource, and at telept4me.com, we can give you this information. Now, why you may want to outsource some of it? As you start growing, you don't want to hire a full-time physical therapist just to see I don't know, 20 tele, tele PT visits. But if you outsource it, you pay for that hour or for that session that you, you um, are getting service for. So that can be a method that uh, uh, to follow. Right now, in our business, we are doing all in-house, but as we grow and telehealth becomes bigger and bigger, we are gonna follow a hybrid blend model where some of it we keep in house, some of it we outsource. Your platform has to be HIPAA compliant. It has to be stable, easy to use. And also it must have add-on features like, be, like being able to do marketing and provide you with data, okay? Now you gotta get training for it. Hands-on seminars provides training that uh, certifies you on telehealth services. Some of you have already done this training. It's pretty good. Um, uh, you know, hands-on seminars is Costas and my company. This course is not our creation. It is a co-branded course, but it's a great course. I've done it, he did it, and our staff have done it. So it's a great, great course. Now, Important, and we'll talk about that also in our conversation here, important key points for um, conversion of patients is the role of your front desk, uh, your patient coordinator, and how they discuss those services to the patient, and the role of, of, of the physical therapist, of course. So here is the thing. In some patients, you may not want to give them the option. You may want to not make it optional. You may say that this is it. You have to do this uh, tele -PT service. This is what we offer right now. And because of your situation, you have to do it. Otherwise, you're not going to get much better. All right. Um, call insurances. All right. This coming Thursday at 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, we are going to have a town hall meeting with the American Physical Therapy Association's Director of Government Affairs. Everybody must attend this meeting because we will discuss exactly what is going on with Medicare and what is the association is doing about Medicare and how soon we expect for Medicare to fully recognize physical therapists as telehealth providers. Okay, so 1 p.m. where are you are going to find information? Go to savephysicaltherapy.com to register for the town hall meeting. New patients is paramount. Why? Because, okay, how much can you leave off your past patients? Only for this long. You really need new blood. So getting new patients in and following and implementing strategies that will bring you new patients is absolutely very, very important. And I'll talk about maintaining your communication lines 
um, after we get into the discussion. And mitigation strategy number five is maintain your office open for as long as possible, okay? Right now, I believe we are off the, the big hump in most places, the big, uh, um, uh, the, the, the top of the cases in, in most places around the country. So our practices should be able to stay open. All right. Um, oh yeah, uh, that soon, don't go yet to that site because it's not active, but soon you'll be able, by the end of the week, you'll be able to go to www.fasttracktorecovery.com and you'll be able to get an ebook from Costas and myself that goes over these five mitigation strategies and more information. Okay, good. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, the panel now. Uh, we have a lot of um, questions and, and, and um, uh, that people are asking here, but the first thing I would like to ask, uh, and I'll ask uh, uh, that to um, Christina. Um, Christina, how are you handling um, staff members and, and what is your strategy in terms of bringing them back? So the first thing that we did um, when we recognized that our business had dropped to 30%, I had a bunch of staff that were afraid to come into work anyway, so we let them not come into work. And we figured out our number. And for us, it was, we had like 15,000 of fixed expenses. And we knew we were only gonna be bringing in about $30,000 a week. So I just said, okay, that's it. We've got to like decrease payroll to 15,000. And for those two weeks, we did pretty good. We got it down to $17,000 a week. After that, that, so that was like the third and fourth week. The first two weeks we had been on regular payroll. And so then week five was last week and we got funded with the PPP loan. So now we were like, okay, we need to start bringing staff back. But like last week we were only at, we grew a little bit from rock bottom, we're at 35%. So I came up with a formula <clears throat> to try to increase, you know, the staff as long as we're also and try to do everything so that they're contributing to increasing the business. So what we came up with was, we had already moved everybody to part-time. And so we started using this term billable hours and what equals a billable hour. So basically our formula, and I might not work for everybody, but for us it works. We do, if they do two inpatient visits that are billable, if they do two telehealth visits that are billable, they, you know, each one of them equals one billable hour. If they do four e-visits, that equals a billable hour. If they do eight calls, like to no fault and workers' comp patients, that equals a billable hour. And then we want to, we know we need to call everybody, all of our patients, past patients. So I wanted to encourage them to call past patients. So we said, as long as they have at least a five minute conversation and they take notes, eight, eight, eight really good calls, that equals an hour. And then we added in um, up to four, four hours of other things. So we said two hours of training. So we've been doing like the telehealth training. And this week, like we've gone from like two weeks ago, we did 30 visits. Last week we did 60. And this week we're going to do 100 visits, which I think will bring us up to at least 40% of our business. So we're really moving in the right direction. So two hours of training, they get another billable hour. And then marketing, we know we have all these projects that we've been like wanting to do. So we want to have like Facebook groups and, you know, eight weeks to, you know, um, get back in shape, you know, so two hours of marketing equals a billable hour. And then today I added two hours of volunteer work. So on your way home, if you stop by the church or a synagogue or a community group and you pack up food or you bring food to someone or when you're talking to your patient, you find out that, you know, they really need milk or coffee or I don't care what they need. Like I just said, just document what you're doing and you can do up to two hours of volunteer work. And then we're doing it with the attitude of, I want everybody to be billing for 40 hours. So it's like, cause I feel like I'm in this race. Like I'm in week two of my eight week spend. So 
I want everybody to get up to the 40 hours, but I want them to be doing things that are going to build the practice up because I feel like it's basically a race to how quickly can I get back to where we were, you know, before my money runs out. So I feel like if everybody does that and they keep all of their hours doing the things that will build the company back up, we'll end up in the right position on the other side. And I think we'll even end up in a better position. So that's, that's our formula. I'll let you know how it works out uh, six weeks from now. <laughs> uh, this is an awesome formula, by the way. Actually, uh, Demi was telling me that formula because you were in a conversation yesterday, and that's great. Quick question for you. You have a hundred appointments. They're all telepathy or they're a, a mixture of both? No, the, 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 te- the hunt, we're, we're at about, we, we're doing a, a good like 300 and something regular appointments across the offices, and now we're doing another hundred in telehealth. I see. That's perfect. So, and it's and it's the therapist. We've mostly been having the therapists. Like I, that's why I wanted to encourage the phone calls. You know, so that they're they're motivated to like get on the phone and have a good conversation. And they, you know, they they can do a really good job getting their patients to want to you know try a telehealth session. Just try one. You know. So we've been doing that. And my marketing person has been helping with the calls too. That's that's. And we've awesome. been marketing like crazy. Like we are. Like this week was like turning stone for us. Like we were just like, this is it. We, we're, we're, we're moving up. Like this week, we're all about like, how do we build the practice back up? And what can we do to, you know, just be out there doing anything to like drive people? In? That's, that's awesome. Good. Thank you, Christina. Um, it, yeah, go, go ahead, Joe. I had actually something to build on that as well, Christina, that oh, you can kind of even run to another level. Um, is calling the past patients. So we have a huge database of past patients and we had some of our staff actually reaching out as well. We found out that there's a big percentage that we were keeping, they weren't answering their phone, we'd leave a voicemail, nobody would return a call. So we got onto, it's called ZipWhip, and we put it, all of our phone numbers into an Excel sheet and then and put it over to ZipWhip and sent out a mass text to all those patients that we weren't able to get a hold of. And I actually personally oversaw that and saw a big incoming of patients who they see us, they don't recognize our number a lot of times. So they think it's an unknown. They think it's, you know, a, a scam. Somebody's trying to call me, but if I leave a personal and it comes from our, it'll come like ZipWhip will come from our Apex number. Yep. And it actually show, and you can text up to like 600 characters a uh, text message. So, it's really so you can send you can send 600 messages at, at, at the same time. We actually sent almost 9,000 <laughs> at one time. Crazy. And what's the name of the company? Zip? Zip Whip. It's a platform that, yeah, just allows mass uh, texting and outreach. And, you know, we figured that, you know, our patients are just like us. I know you guys are probably the same way. If somebody calls me and leaves a voicemail, I'll probably never even listen to it or pick up my phone for that matter. But if somebody texts me, I'm going to answer really quick, like within five minutes, I'm going to respond. So we just took that behavior. And over the weekend, I think Joe scheduled just from doing that over the weekend, Joe scheduled 25 telehealth evals Mm -hmm. in like a day just from doing that. So, yep. And and one other thing that I learned early on from it is give them an option. So have them say yes to schedule, no to be just, I don't, I don't like this idea or more so that we can continue the conversation, but give them something. Cause a lot of times they just think, oh, I don't need to answer. But if you put like in bold, yes, no, or more then they, most of the people will respond back. And then now we keep those in a different, so we kind of just can play around with it, but it's, it's yeah. a nice way to communicate. So, so somebody is asking if you can share the narrative on the actual text. Um, oh yeah, please, I actually, please. I, also, please. <laughs> I do have that and I can forward that. Yeah, I have, but, very set. So when somebody says yes, I have verbiage saved. I have no because I want to close the caption. They, you know, we're here for for you if you need us. Stay safe, Team Apex. And then I also have verbiage awesome. for more to plug in to keep the conversation. Awesome. Going. So, yeah. If if you guys are willing to share that, you can share it uh, share it with Costas and I, and yep. we are going to put it on the under the resources under the resources area of uh, savephysicaltherapy.com. And it will be compliments of the McGill rates. And, uh, and then one, one other thing too, it, it is compliant. So all these numbers are not gonna go into some database. So there is platforms out there. If you look it up, you can send out like thousands instantly and you don't have to 
pay for the service, but the service protects all of your patients' numbers so that they're not, you know, spammed or anything. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys. I, and we're going to come up with some follow-up question for you on some other things you are doing, but I wanted to uh, talk a little bit to Bart. And uh, Bart, I, I would like you to talk about two things. Uh, and the first is how are you using um, the program? First of all, how are you thinking or planning perhaps to use some of the funding like the EIDL funding potentially and and uh, then how are you using um, the uh, loan uh, pro not loan program but student loan repayment program uh, with your staff uh, to create um, uh, I guess staff retention and staff high production, especially when it comes to diagnostics. You bet. Thanks, Timmy. So one of the things that we've been we've been talking about is that in the time at which there's economic downturn, and and specifically in our kind of micro microcosm of the world in physical therapy, um, obviously if we're straining and hurting as businesses, all of our competitors are as well. And there's a fair amount, we think, in our environment, in our state, that in the next six months, we'll be looking to perhaps exit PT. And, and so part of that EIDL loan, what we're looking to achieve is to uh, reach out in the next two to three months to as many of the practices in our area as possible, just to get a feel for what everybody else is doing in problem solving. But in that process, we're also going to get a feel for who's trying to exit their, their practice. And we think that there's probably some opportunity that will be mutually beneficial. If there's, if there's folks that are not going to stay in, in the game in the, long, in the long term, perhaps we can invest in them and, and do some practice acquisition. And that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do. We're trying to be very straightforward about it because we don't want anybody to think we're doing kind of a conversation bait and switch, but we really are just reaching out to the practices and then, hey, if, if you don't think you're going to weather this storm, what's, what are the game plans do you have? We are looking actually for opportunities to expand and, um, and certainly don't want to do that on the edge of somebody else's um, negative experience or taking advantage of them anyway, but for a mutually beneficial exchange. Um, the other thing that we've had huge success in prior to COVID and really has been really a, a game changer for us in maintaining our staff through this period. And I think even recruiting, I was talking to a physical therapist just today that wants more information on this, but is student loan repayment. Obviously all these are, are on hold right now for a majority of our students, uh, uh, our physical therapists, but um, we know they're afraid to have to be paying those student loans again. And so what we did through our diagnostics was we set up a, a, an incentive program that, uh, that utilized diagnostics primarily um, through ultrasound to get started because the learning curve is, is fairly, fairly quick there for most physical therapists that have an, a desire for anatomy and can transpose what they're seeing um, in netter and take it to a grayscale slice. Um, it's very practical, very usable. And so what we did with each of our new, newer physical therapists, we knew that uh, they were struggling with student loans and said, hey, look, if you can do 20 ultrasounds a month, which is not very difficult, if you can do 20 of these a month, um, uh, we will essentially pay an extra $10,000 a year into your student loan account. And so whether you look at that as a bonus and, and, and that, that type of a thing, it, it really doesn't matter either way. Uh, it gives them the opportunity to uh, use diagnostics for the benefit of their patient um, and be able to give them a personal income stream that really helps them to get out of their personal problems when it comes to their financial struggle to get out of student loans. We were all there. I think all of us were there. Um, and we understand their needs. And so by creating a solution, we found in our practice that it really jumped the interest as well as the uh, time commitment to get through the learning curve on being able to put this into practice in everyday physical therapy. 
Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so there are some questions that um, uh, have come here on the question list that we can tackle a little bit. Um, there are some people have a, a problem that their patients are, do not seem to be interested in e-visits. And I guess they mean also uh, telehealth in general. And this person says, and our physical therapists agree. <laughs> Any thoughts? So, okay, so who would like to answer that? Well, I can tell you what we did because we had the same problem with a couple of therapists. So it, you know what it is? It's truly a confidence thing. Like telehealth is like being a brand new therapist. So uh, they weren't even really listening to me because I wasn't the one doing the telehealth. So they didn't, you know, wasn't, they didn't have the confidence in me even though I was telling the story. So what I did was I got all my therapists on a Zoom call just like this. And I had the therapists share with each other and problem solve. And um, I was on another call where they had something from the National Health uh, NHS or something like that that said, it takes a physician 12 to 18 telehealth visits for the physician to be comfortable with the technology, just doing a telehealth session. So they're not freaking out that they're gonna you know, do the wrong thing. And then it said it takes them 20 to 50 sessions to actually feel that they can get as good of a result telehealth wise as in the office. And so the whole premise of that was, it's, it's normal to feel the way we feel. But what I found was once the therapist did it, they were shocked. Like they were like, oh my God, I actually really helped that patient. Plus we also did the training. We did your training and we did the uh, total motion release training, but same, same thing. The therapists were their own worst enemies. And, and, and while I'm showing this, I, I totally agree that that training is 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 important because I'll tell you what what uh, some people have done is they tell their therapist, okay, now we're going telehealth. Um, get in your FaceTime, get in your Zoom, whatever, and do telehealth. And the therapist is like, what? How the heck are we going to do that? How am I going to do special tests on a patient with telehealth so I can write my eval? How am I going to do manual muscle test on a patient via telehealth? Okay. So, and this is actually the, 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 the purpose of, of, of this course is like really to go over like, what are the special tests for telehealth? Uh, how do we treat? How do you follow up with patients? How do you do all that? So, so it gives you the basics, basically on 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 how to do it. Um, so that's that's very important. Like from our point of view, we had to train the therapists, and then we had even to give them scripts, scripts to give to their patient to talk to their patients using those scripts. Okay. Um, Another. Another interesting part is the age of the therapist. The older, like me, <laughs> which is what I know is my hands. You know, I cannot figure out how talking to a patient is going to change anything. But again, as with everything else, as you said, Christina, it's a learning curve. The minute you do it once, twice, three times, then it becomes easy. And you recognize the fact that this patient cannot go anywhere anyway. I mean, they're stuck at home. They cannot go out. There are Medicare, whatever. So that's the only way to make them feel better. What's wrong with that, you know? So totally get it, great job again. Uh, but it's interesting how the dynamics between young and old therapists uh, change things a bit. But again, that's the future. Uh, and, and it would be nice, you know, if we have time to talk about how we're gonna manage the future of physical therapy with that COVID-19 threat or the fear that the public has around conducting other people. So we need to start figuring out that new model, whether it's teletherapy, because it's here to stay. And of course, the new way of handling actual life, actual life visits with that fear factor. I'm going to go through, uh, Costa, uh, answering very quickly some of the questions 
uh, that they have to do with the stimulus program and the PPP and all that stuff. And then I, I would really like to tackle this thing about the future. Um, so there is a question whether when you attest on the HHS money, whether that puts you on an audit list. Uh, no, it does not. They know that you got it already. Whether you attest or not, it's assumed that you got it, unless you tell them that you didn't get the money. So um, you got them. Um, are you able to have PPP loan and EIDL funding as well? Okay, so this is like a, an interesting question um, because essentially what is supposed to be happening, the, the, the PPP money is supposed to cover the forgivable portion of the $10,000, right? But let me give you a scenario. What if you got your PPP money and then you get the EIDL money at a later point? What happens with that? Well, I really am not 100% sure. Why? Because there is no financial institution yet that has released the application of forgiveness. So we do not know yet what will be included in that forgiveness and if they will ask you in that forgiveness if you got separate EIDL money. So we don't know the answer to that yet. Okay, by the way, it is not necessary that you are gonna get a full $10,000. If you didn't receive it already, those of you who didn't receive it already, you will receive, in order for you to get the full $10,000, you must declare that you have more than 10 employees. Otherwise, you are gonna get a proportion to the number of employees you have. Have you started to receive payments for telehealth and e-visits? Yes, there are payments coming in, both in our organization, but I know of other organizations that get paid for telehealth as well as e-visits. Um, okay, people are thanking us. Uh, the texting service, you have to spell it because people cannot get what you say. So, it's Z I E zip, like you zip up a coat and then whip W H I P. Okay, zip whip. Okay, I just uh, put it in there. E visits. Yeah. What happens if you don't get your PPP money by May 5th? So, how does that affect the June 30th deadline? Uh, we are not even certain yet if there are fine points in the new approval they made in terms of if there are additional points or extension of the time on the new package that is coming out right now. So until we know that, there is no um, uh, specific answer to that question. So I'm going to circle back to Christina and ask you this. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll make it a combined question. What do you see in terms of the uh, future of physical therapy? And I have to talk, guys, about future. All right, you know, uh, uh, let me put it this way. I have been there, and Costas has been there with you from the very beginning, through the town halls, through the webinars, through everything, okay? So we've been hugging each other at distance, all of us. We've been crying at each other's shoulders at distance. And we've vented, we've did this, we did that. Okay, you know what? Enough is enough. Let's look at the freaking future now, okay? We'll get the money also, the remaining 70% of us. We'll get the PPP money. We gotta look at the future. We cannot survive with borrowed money forever and ever, okay? It will be a help for a couple of months, but we really need to create. Without production, without creation, nothing can exist. And that's why those who are gonna decide to be stuck in the past, stuck in the misery or that I'm the victim and what happened to me and this and that, they are not gonna be able to survive. We have to say, okay, enough of that, let's move on now, okay? So we have to make that decision. So let's talk about future. So Christina, looking at the future, what do you see the future is of the private practice, physical therapy, and how also secondary question do you see the implementation 
of uh, both telehealth and diagnostics, especially for people who don't have these in their practices? I mean, you have both. Um, how do you see that playing a role? Good question. Uh, well, I see that, I think, you know, we'll continue to use telehealth, you know, so if somebody's sick or they can't get a ride, it'll be really easy now to have a session with them. In terms of um, physical therapy, I think that through this whole process, we have gained even more autonomy. Most of the physician offices, many of them are closed. So when someone's having a problem, they're coming to us first. You know, we've gotten better. We're doing tons of marketing direct to the public. So we're driving in our patients, we're bypassing the physicians, driving them into the practice. The diagnostics fits perfectly with that. You know, if somebody has pain radiating down their arm, you bring them in, you do an EMG, you figure out, you know, where's the problem? Is it a shoulder problem or a neck problem? Or, you know, they have numbness and tingling in their feet. Is it neuropathy? We can do musculoskeletal ultrasound. So I think the future is, I think, in the end, when, when we come through this, I think our therapists have um, stepped up and taken a lot more responsibility for the patients. And I think everyone's getting more involved in the marketing. So I see that as they're all learning to talk the talk. I think that, I know we talked about this the other day that you know they keep talking about the um, comorbidities that go with COVID and how that's contributing to the people that are being put on ventilators. I think that we as physical therapists could own that. And I think that, you know, we can use, you know, musculoskeletal ultrasound to look at um, muscle wasting. I think, you know, there's just so many things that we can do and it's become, people are talking more about it. So I feel like in the future, why can't we as physical therapists be a big part of, you know, I think Amy, you would coin the phrase, you know, making America healthy again or something like that but um i don't know why 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 not us why why can't we be the people that help americans so that their immune system is better and they're healthier and we start tackling these comorbidities which is why we're spending all of our dollars you know why people are ending up in the hospital not just for covid anything so i feel like there's a there's a lot of opportunity out there and we will get through it we just gotta keep moving in the right direction Thank you, Christina. Um, uh, and, and I'm going to go um, to McGilvray's to ask them the same question. And also, I would like to give you guys um, kind of the, uh, a, a flair on the question in regards to the amazing um, social media work that you do. So, so, so here is my point, OK? I'll tell you this. These guys, the McGilvery's, okay, I, I, let, me, let me give you my estimation in terms of their um, social media abilities or presence, I would say um, less than a year ago, maybe eight months ago. I would say average, okay? Let me tell you right now, they are the queen and the king of physical therapy social media. And I truly mean it. And uh, let me tell you this. She's going to be humble to tell you that. But let me explain to you what she does. Okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reveal your secret right now. Okay. One day a week, she has a video guy following her throughout the day in everything that she does. From the moment she feeds the dogs in the morning until the moment she feeds the dogs at night again, a video guy follows her and actually takes video clips that he edits them and distributes it to them. And voila, the miracle call happens. Apex is releasing a ton, a ton of high quality video on Facebook. Uh, they, I mean, I believe that they are right now probably the best I have seen in social media for physical therapy per se. Okay. Um, and um, so now your turn, guys. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so 
to, to add the social media flair, I think I can piggyback off of what Christina was saying from the direct access and marketing to our consumer. Um, that has been our approach pre-COVID and now it has really been our approach post -COVID, or throughout and post-COVID for, for the future is just to really do that community, straight to community outreach um, and get our patients in the door to see us as the movement experts, as the gatekeeper into, into the medical system when they have a musculoskeletal uh, injury or acute onset of uh, some type of pain, sports injury. Um, you know, we're really promoting that right now as we're trying to keep patients out of the ERs and the walk-ins and stuff like that. As you said, Christina, why can't it be us that continues to promote that moving forwards? And um, as we said earlier with text message, you know, there are two places that when you open your phone, you look at, you look to see if you have a text message and you open your social media. Those are the two places you go. Anything else, you wait until, you know, maybe nine o'clock at night, or like I said, I won't even listen to a voicemail half the time. Um, so that's where we really put our um, marketing, um, our marketing platforms in and kind of where we've taken our approach moving forwards from, from that standpoint. Um, can I add on the diagnostics just a second, Demi, too? Yeah, um, so we had a great, uh, a great thing come out of this uh, recently from the diagnostic standpoint from an outside business. You know, I'm like the rest of you guys, we only have about 35% of our people in the clinic right now. So of course our diagnostics in the clinic are much lower. Um, we had the ability to, we had a, a physician's assistant for a local orthopedic group who reached out to us and he himself needed an EMG done. And the, uh, pra the other practice, the neurology practice, they're closed. So um, asked if we could do it. And um, I have to give Joe the credit for this one. Joe said, of course we can do it, but can we come to your office and do it at your doctor's office so the physicians can see, so your staff can see, so everybody can see how it is that we do this. And, um, and then we have maybe have the opportunity to work together more for this. And so Joe and our other um, uh, EMG uh, trained therapist went to the doctor's office. Joe spent the time being able to talk with Throughout, you know, throughout the test while our other therapist actually administered the EMG test. Um, so it went very, very well. And then Joe started talking to the, to the practice and you know, the pain points came out that number one, they want it to be easy for their patients. And number two, they want revenue. I mean, it's, it's not a joke guys. I mean, we are businesses. We can't like, you know, hide from the fact that we need to talk about revenue too. We know we got to take care of patients, but you know, the, the, there is that revenue piece. And they said, you know, that that's our biggest thing, revenue. So of course we're already in talks with them. Well, as soon as you guys open back up again, we'll be right in your office. We can jump your revenue up so quickly because now we'll be able to test. You'll be able to test these people right in the office and get them quickly to determine surgery, no surgery. Boom, boom, boom. We are right there. We're touching on their pain point and, and solving that problem for them. So this was a great opportunity that came out of um, this epidemic and something that, you know, that was just one doctor's office and um, something that Joe, that's, uh, that's on his to-do list to uh, go out and knock on a bunch more doctor's office's doors. <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. Very good. Um, in terms, uh, um, uh, uh, in terms of you, Bart, how do you see the future of PT, and uh, um, how you are planning to uh, continue expand operations um, in the near future? You know, I, I, I think kind of just going right along with what Christina and the McGilveries have been talking about it. We really have to be able to give more bang for our buck to our patients and to be able to uh, really give them more than what we have as, as physical therapists in the past. Let me just give you a quick example on this, Demi. So yesterday I had a patient that came in and was referred to me. Again, may in the past have gone to a neurologist, one of my competitors for an EMG, uh, but the, the doctor sent them to me because they knew that uh, I was still open and was, was treating with PPE and being very cautious. And so 
the patient came in and had uh, left upper extremity pain and the, and the pain radiated down intermittently down into the hand. And, uh, and so he wanted an EMG done. Um, when I did the EMG, the outcome was is the patient had moderate carpal tunnel actually bilaterally, but also that didn't encapsulate like all the answers for the patient's problems, had quite a bit of shoulder pain. So then I went down and did an ultrasound, musculoskeletal ultrasound of the patient's shoulder and found a partial thickness tear uh, with some uh, subacromial bursitis there at, at the shoulder. And so we created then a treatment plan, floated this back to the physician and said, yeah, we're gonna treat this with PT. We know we can get it better. If we think for just a moment what we bypassed in offering this level of PT to the patient, they would have had oh, uh, probably yeah. an initial uh, uh, visit with an orthopedic surgeon who then would have sent them from an MRI, then would have sent them to a neurologist, then would have brought them back in and would have had them collaborate on all the testing done and then sent them to physical therapy. Like, I'm not kidding. But we would have mm -hmm. same later. <laughs> and now we've just cut to the chase because yeah. through diagnostics, we're smarter, better, and, and we can deliver this type of care directly to our patient without having to have all that cost. What do I think really is going to happen on the backside of COVID? I think people are going to be more worried about their co-pays. I think they're going to want more bang for their buck out of every single visit that they come in for physical therapy. And, and what I can show them through the, the diagnostics piece is that, uh, is that exactly what their problem is for less cost and exactly how we're going to get them better in a, in a very concise treatment plan that not always is physical therapy. Sometimes we're referring on for surgery, of course. But let's, let's only treat with physical therapy when we know we're going to get 100% win instead of, well, let's treat for six weeks and, and guess it. I don't like those days. I'm really happy to be past them. Um, and then in the process of that, the other step that I think we really need to take as physical therapists is find a way to deliver this type of care without increasing our overhead in other types of venues. So I think in Idaho, we think that our, our gyms are, are, are probably going to be open. Our local gyms are going to be open in probably another two weeks. And one of the things that we're trying to put together is a little platform to be able to say, hey, look, we want each of our providers here in, in our different offices to be the physical therapist at XYZ gym and, uh, and have a mutual exchange with that gym where we help to keep their, their, their membership up so that when people are injured, we use diagnostics to find out what the problem is, treat them and even treat them there in their gym to keep them as a, a vital role and, and kind of utilize the gyms that are around us as, as a satellite extension. So this is what, something we've been talking about even pre-COVID for the last six months. I think that the, uh, the, the community at large and especially gyms are gonna be very primed to be able to know how they're gonna survive. And so our goal is to then create a solution, be a part of a solution for them that opens more doors for us. Nice. Um, awesome, uh, very good. Um, let me ask um, uh, one final thing from my side, at least. Um, what, what a physical therapist in private practice must not do now? What they must not do? Okay, because we tell people what they should do or what is good to do. What would be a mistake? you think? What do you think would be a mistake for someone in private practice to do right now? Um, and I'm going to start with Costas. Costas, what do you think would be a mistake? Um, a mistake is to tell them to market more. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Save your money. Stay home. And just, of course, Again, life, it's all about control, right? So what we are lacking right now, it's, it's control. We, don't, we cannot control the environment because there is uncertainty. There is, again, fear. And we try to figure out what the future is. So there are two things you can do. One of them is just wait in a chair, you know, sit in your sofa, take your blanket also, cover yourself, and wait for something good to happen. Or make a decision and say, you know what? No, I'm going to do something about it. What is that? And by the way, why physical therapists are open? Do you think we're, we're open because we're making money right now? No, we're open because we're offering something. You know, everybody is at home. 
we are every day at work. You know, seriously, first of all, it feels so much better the fact that I'm going every day to work. And now because there is no traffic in New York, I'm taking the bicycle from where I live and I go to my place with a bicycle and I love it. Okay, so, and I keep myself busy, not because I want to make myself feel better, because I know that I can control my future by organizing my environment. So the number one thing is for all of us to be as active as we're supposed to be in. And physical therapists, they know more than anybody else what action is, right? We, we dictate to others how to move, what to do, how to create their own future so it can be a better future. That's what we do. We know better than others. So the number one thing is to just go out there, figure out, you, you know what to do, just keep doing what you're doing so far and that's great, help people. And the other thing, again, I think it's what all of you guys have described that now is the time to reach out to the public and give the message that we are here for them. And I think that's the best we can do right now. Got it. Thank you, Costa. Christina? I don't know. The only thing that came up in my mind was like um, the word, the mis biggest mistake would be giving up. But it kind of is the same thing that Costa said. But that, I think, is the biggest mistake is if you throw in the towel and I've been finding that when I feel overwhelmed and I feel like, oh my God, like I heard myself one time say, oh gosh, I wish I could have just stayed in Florida. I wish I just worked for the government or something. <laughs> I know that's terrible, but you know, I think we all have those days, but what's been helping me a lot has been these meetings. You know, like I get on the meetings and I hear like the good suggestions and I Honestly, they, that's what uplifts me. It's like being with people that are finding, um, are doing something that can make a difference. So yeah, yeah don't give up. Awesome. awesome. Thank you, Christina. Um, Joe and Angie um, answer that question, but also please answer something that uh, uh, some people are asking and I am asking you specifically that because there was one incident of that with you guys. Um, this person says, if uh, you've had any negative community feedback because you stayed open and some feel would be helping spread the virus, okay? So answer about what someone should not do and answer also this question if you don't mind. The, the first one I'll answer you, Demi, is if a like a private practice owner is going to return to normal um, there is no normal from before if you try and return to the normal before pre-covid then you're going to sink fast it, this has changed the, us a lot and we all know that especially the practices have kind of been pushing and there's going to be a whole new normal so you have to adjust to that and adjust quick and, and that's how you've said all along Demi. You know, you can be flat, flat at the bottom and try and recover, or you, you kind of push your way through and change and, and, and get through it. And then after, you're going to return to a new normal a lot quicker. So that's my, my take. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll, uh, I'll field the Demi's question about the, the social media. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we put ourselves out there on social media a lot. So, of course, we do have um, do you see some comments now and then uh, with regards to other uh, people in the physical therapy world, even other physical therapists who have made comments from the standpoint of, um, you know, how are you still open? You, you know, you being open is just uh, helping to spread the virus and, and this and that. Um, and, you know, in my experience, those people are, you know, they're in fear, they're in panic. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's, that's not a good place to be. Um, so I just address it back with kindness, you know. Um, thank you for your concern. Wish them well. That, that's all you can do. Um, and, and we move forwards. And I know, and I think everybody on this call knows that we are essential and that we're here to serve our community the best we can. And that's what we're doing. So. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Yeah. And I have a, just one quick thing yep. that just goes along with that. I had a patient I did an MSKUS on a, about a week ago. Uh, she uh, uh, fell at home walking her dog. She did a telehealth visit with her family doc who said, well, maybe you should, you know, see if there's therapy open. She contacted us. 
and the therapist wasn't comfortable. And the second visit I did the MSKUS and I actually found that she fr uh, fractured her kneecap. Oh so that changed her whole thing one, I mean, a hundred percent. So, and again, it's for us to be there and be able to do that for her. And she's about, you know, she's doing very well now, but if we had tried to just shove a bunch of exercises down, yeah, she would not be doing very well. So uh, awesome, that was, man. Yeah. That, that, that's a great comment. And actually, um, before I even tell um, uh, Bart to uh, give his uh, last uh, words on the same question, it, it is the best point for me to plug my promo and action piece and say that, you know, if you guys, those of you who are attending this, if you want to realize the same benefits and the same experiences that the people are um, with us uh, here today as panelists that they have experienced uh, with uh, diagnostics. Because of COVID-19, HADS has now a totally new program that you can literally come into HADS and learn all of these things, the EMG, the ultrasound, the vestibular testing, all of that stuff with just an initial payment of $5,000. And uh, you can go to hadsmeeting.com and schedule a discovery call and you'll be able to get the data um, uh, there um, in your discovery call. Bart? Yeah, I, I, think, I think the worst thing that we can do right now is nothing. I think that's been, been uh, explained. But I think we need to move forward in a very strategic way. Uh, one thing that we're doing, it kind of addresses the question of why are you open, is we're actually doing a local... TV commercial we're putting together this week. And, and a lot of it is some old footage that we've had because uh, we're not going to get together with TV crews right now. Uh, but we're going to throw some things in there about the PPE um, utilization that we have. We're not going to use that verbiage because most people, when they say PPE, don't know what that means. So we're, we just looked at our script today and we're, we're kind of honing that in. We all kind of voted on our script production there. But we want to get the message out that, yes, uh, actually, in our community, we were the first ones to go to telehealth. We were the first ones to restrict the types of patients that were coming in our doors from PT. We were the most conservative, honestly. And, and at first, we were kind of poked at for that. And now, as we're moving forward and still taking care of our, our folks uh, and our community this way, to get any negative feedback, we gotta be a little louder in response. So we're gonna invest in that and get that message out there. Um, awesome. But I, I really think in the in the grand scheme of things that that represents what we need to do. Uh, we need to proactively uh, invest, take the opportunity, seize the day. Um, we're not looking to step on other people's struggles right now. We're looking to build our future. And everybody's in the same boat. I think what's going to happen as we move forward is that those that were looking to uh, take care of their communities and really capitalize on making a difference for physical therapy are going to be the physical therapists of tomorrow. Awesome. Thank you, Bart. And before I close, I have to answer that, that question because um, uh, people are asking and it's very pertinent. The question is, well, how do you do the training on, on HADS, on, on diagnostics, uh, if people um, uh, cannot travel, let's say, to New York or whatever because of COVID-19. Um, we have started doing, actually, we just did an EMG training um, online. Actually, we call it live online, and I'm going to tell you about that. And we have another one on ultrasound coming up next week, which is live online. As a matter of fact, the McGillivrays are putting two of their staff members on that <laughs> training. Um, so how does that work, okay? So um, we have the program, which is a lot of the materials are delivered online. And then on what we call live online portion, you have two therapists, two students in whatever location, and we are using, we are using a double Zoom, a Zoom on the screen of the ultrasound, let's say, or a zoom on the EMG screen, mm -hmm. and a second zoom on a device, on a phone, um, that, or Google glasses uh, with camera that show the actual um, uh, either EMG technique or the transducer of the ultrasound, and the faculty gives instructions 
on how to perform actually the technique based on the video they watch. So it's, it's very fascinating. Uh, we tried it this past weekend. It worked very well. And we are looking forward to do that in the future. However, everybody who gets into the training uh, with HADS, uh, you have unlimited training. You can repeat each and every course unlimited number of times. So you can start it now with virtual, the way we do it. And as soon as uh, everything is back open, you can repeat that course uh, once again in a live capacity uh, at one of the training locations. So and, Amy, if, if they're in New York, we can give them some private training. Uh, today I was training one of our members, myself on ultrasound, and Thursday is going to be the same thing because they're in New York, so they can come to my R office with the masks, of course, with the gowns and the gloves, but we can do training in New York one-on-one -on -one if there is need. Absolutely. Awesome. Very good. So thank you all so much. Um, and again, it, it, I guess it was like a consensus because at the end I wanted to say that the worst thing that a being can do is to do nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that you guys are here, uh, the fact that you are uh, looking forward to the future means that you are uh, doing something about it. And that is uh, great. Uh, Christina, thank you so much. Joe and Angie, thank you guys very much. And Bart, thank you. You guys are amazing. Uh, Costas and I thank you for everything that you do. And uh, remember, uh, Thursday's town hall meeting, we're going to talk all about Medicare, 1 p.m. Eastern. Register at savephysicaltherapy.com. Take care, guys. Good night. Thank you, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.